Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. If you're going to oppress an entire people, you have to lay the groundwork so that it seems reasonable and just. It starts with replacing the truth with a lie, a whole series of lies. The Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Really? At the time that Jacob moved to Egypt with his 12 sons and their households, there were about 70 of them. We're told in verse 5 that the total number of people born to Jacob was 70. Now, that's not born to Jacob directly. He had 12 sons and he moved to Egypt when he was an old man, so he didn't directly father 58 more kids. What's clearly meant is that he was the head of a large clan that included 70 people, sons, grandsons, and granddaughters, and some greats. And we know don't know how many generations have passed between the time of Joseph's death and this Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, but even if it were a bunch of generations, they are going to outnumber the Egyptians, who you can assume are also having babies throughout this period. So even granting what it says in verse 7, that the Israelites were fruitful and prolific, they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. It's still a stretch what he's saying, that there's more of them than us, and they are more powerful than we are. There's a plenty of room between a lot and more. I mean, we're talking one clan of people from Canaan versus the whole territory of Egypt. The whole population of Canaan wouldn't come close to that of Egypt. So sure, they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, but that's a far cry from they are more numerous and more powerful than we. We being the Egyptian empire at the height of its power and influence, a world power long before the rise of the Greeks, the Romans, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, all those people. And, and there's something of a replacement theory going on here. They're taking over. They'll join our enemies and kill us, seek our total destruction. This is an old tactic that's used to great effect still today to get a native population to oppress a minority of population. The Nazis did it against the Jews. It was done against former slaves after Reconstruction in the lead up to Jim Crow segregation. Populists are doing it now in France against the Arabs, and it's being used against Mexicans and refugees from Central America coming to the United States. And it's all based on lies. This is what we see Pharaoh doing against the Hebrews living in Egypt after Joseph. And the reason he does it is to inspire fear in the hearts of the regular Egyptian population so that they will go along with his plan to enslave the Hebrews. They'll see him as their savior. He's protecting them and their jobs and their well-being. He's protecting their wives and daughters against the brutes. And you may wonder, why does he even have to do that? convince the people. I mean, he's king. He can do whatever he wants. It's not like he has to face an election or anything. And it's true, he doesn't have to run for re-election or anything like that. But tyrants always have needed to legitimize their tyranny in the eyes of the people because, after all, they do outnumber him and the small number of sycophants that surround him. And even if he has an army with horses and chariots and stuff, he draws his army from the people. So if he doesn't somehow earn the loyalty and devotion of the people, if he mistreats the mamas and the papas of the soldiers that make up his army, well, he might find his army following another leader who promises to treat the people better. It's not like military coups are modern invention. They've been going on as long as there have been kings and armies. By identifying a common enemy in the form of a population group defined as an other, Pharaoh not only gets a free labor force for all his building projects, I mean, those large slabs of rock don't make it to the top of a pyramid on their own, you know, he gets the native population to turn their anger, their fear, their frustration 
in a different direction than towards the palace. And then they themselves will f sacrifice their own interest for the sake of Pharaoh and his interest. So he replaces the truth with a series of lies. He engenders fear and resentment of a minority group in the native population. And then he focuses that fear and resentment toward the minority group to justify his oppression. They will willingly join in the oppression. And so the oppression came. I mean, not overnight. It takes time to seep into the psyche of the people, but it doesn't take too much time. I mean, fear of the other is kind of baked into our survival instincts deep in that reptilian part of the brain where the fear of heights and public speaking reside. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. Notice the plural there. The king spoke to his people and they set taskmasters over the Hebrews to oppress them with forced Forced labor. You can't enslave an entire ethnic group without the complicity of the people. But one other thing is needed to oppress a people and keep them under oppression. And it's stated there right at the beginning. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He did not know Joseph. Not that he didn't know about Joseph. That's not what it says. And nor is that believable that this new king didn't know about Joseph or everybody knew about Joseph, at least in the elite's inner circles where the kings come from. Joseph w was a bigwig. He rose to power under a previous pharaoh and was responsible for saving Egypt from starving during a long, long famine, one that lasted seven years. You know the story, right? Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream about seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and then he outlined a plan whereby the king would collect the excess grain of the people during the seven years of plenty, and he would store it. And then when the famine hit, the people could come and buy the grain back from Pharaoh. Now, the plan wasn't without its flaws. It was, after all, their own grain that the people were buying back, except they didn't have any savings with which to buy it back because, you know, all their savings were in the storehouses which were built and owned by the king. And since possession is nine-tenths of the law and Pharaoh controlled the other one-tenth, well, then they had to sell their livestock and then their land, and in many cases themselves, in order to purchase the grain which they had grown in the first place. But still, I mean, details. At least they didn't starve. And Joseph was responsible for this ingenious plan that kept the Egyptian people fed and enlarged the coffers of the king. The storehouses that he had built were still there for everyone to see. Hey, who built all these storehouses? The Hebrew Joseph. Oh, cool. And, and Joseph wasn't the answer to just that question. Hey, where did all these Hebrews come from? That guy, Joseph, the one who built all the storehouses? Yep, that would be the one. Now, understand, Egypt at that time wasn't just full of Egyptians. People came from all over the Mediterranean to trade with the greatest superpower in the area. Some traveled there by sea, but many came by land, traveling in caravans from Nubia in the south and Libya in the west and all around the rest of the Mediterranean. And many of those caravans had to go through Canaan. And so many of the peoples who lived in Canaan traveled themselves to Egypt and some settled there. And you know what the Egyptians called them? Egyptians, yeah. Egyptian might have started out as an ethnic group, but at the height of the Egyptian empire, an Egyptian was someone who lived in Egypt, regardless of where they came from or what language they spoke. So the people in Egypt, including the Egyptian kings, weren't, weren't prone to racial strife and asserting ethnic superiority. Pharaoh just wanted some cheap labor cheap as in free. And, and Joseph was nobody compared to that. Joseph who? A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. The word know there isn't about information, you know, knowing stuff. It's a relational word. It's sometimes used euphemistically as in Abraham knew Sarah, wink, wink, and she conceived and bore a son. Now, it's, it's not always that intimate, but it is 
that personal. It's about knowing someone personally, which indicates some level of, of involvement and, and friendship, a, a mutually beneficial relationship. So to not know Joseph, well, of course he didn't. Joseph had been long dead, but that's not all that it's saying. It's saying that the relationship between Pharaoh and his people and Joseph and his people was over. It was no longer a mutually beneficial relationship. It was a one-way relationship, beneficial to the king, beneficial to the Egyptians who wouldn't have to do all the hard, dirty, low-paying jobs that sapped their strength, stole their spirits, and shortened their lives. These Hebrews could do it for free. To not know Joseph meant that you could depersonalize his people and then dehumanize them, which is always a necessary step to enslaving them. If you erase the memory of Joseph, you erase the history of his people there in Egypt. And a people without a history is a people without an identity. And people without an identity, well, they're hardly human. When the Germans rounded up the Jews and sent them to their concentration camps, they took their clothes, which are ethnic markers, and gave them uniforms, void of any personalizing factors other than size. Instead of names, they assigned them a number, tattooed on their skin so they could never forget it, but also so they wouldn't have to remember it either. It was a, a human then. They also stripped them of their religion, another ethnic marker, perhaps the ethnic marker. There were no synagogues at Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and at Dachau. The result was the Jews were no longer individuals. They were just, they were just a mass of undifferentiated living cells, a cancer. When captured Africans were brought to the farms and plantations of the 13 colonies, north as well as south, they too were stripped of their pasts. Their distinct tribal languages and dialects were lost within a generation or two, and they were forced to learn English, albeit a, a strange form of English that sometimes used the pronunciations and grammatical features of their original languages. They were forced to accept the religion of their enslavers, a twisted form of Christianity that told them that God created them to serve the white man, and so to accept God's will for their lives, to be slaves, that they'd be happier that way. Their African names were lost to history. They were given English names. And when a surname was required, they had to use that of their owners. In Maryland, the only Eubanks as I've ever met have been black. Part of my family, a more distant branch than the Mississippi clan I'm from, settled in Anne Arundel County and then to the Eastern Shore. They must have owned slaves, but that branch uh, apparently died out or moved away, leaving only the descendants of their slaves to carry on the, the Eubanks name in Maryland until we moved up here from the South. But here's the difference. I can trace my Eubanks lineage back unbroken to the early 18th century and with some gaps all the way back into the 1600s in England. Through my mother's side of the family, her maternal grandfather, Walter Latimer's side, I can go back nine generations to Luther Latimer, who was born in England around 1690. And through my mother's maternal grandmother, Mary Adele Latille, I can go back eight generations to Alexander Antoine Latille de Timricourt, who was born in Cisteron, France in 1743. He moved to New Orleans and married Jean Goujon de Grandel on November the 11th. 11th, 1761. But the only two Maryland Eubankses that I have ever known, Virgil and Vernon Eubanks, two African-American brothers with whom I went to high school, they've been deprived of that kind of history and those kinds of memories. At best, they can go back maybe four generations if there are receipts or re records surviving that detail the buying or selling of their great-great-great-grandparents. See, <laughs> The first oppression, the one that comes before enslavement and which lasts long after it is over, is the erasure of a people's history, the forgetting of their memories. There arose a new king who did not know Joseph. And this is why the Jews insist that a Holocaust museum be built and that the German gas chambers not be torn down not merely in the hope that it never happens again, but because they were almost deprived of the privilege of remembering 
and never forgetting where they came from. It's why the descendants of former American slaves insist that the history of slavery in America be taught in all its brutal honesty, because much of their histories have been lost. And to subject what little remains to distortion and alternative facts and to wipe it from our children's history books altogether would be to continue the 400-year oppression and subject them to a final brutal indignity. It's why the defining event of the Hebrew slave struggle for freedom, the Passover, is one of remembering having been repeated uninterrupted each spring since the Iron Age. And it's why Jesus gathered with his disciples at the annual feast of Passover and taking the Passover bread and a Passover cup of wine said, remember, remember me, remember my sacrifice. Remember that I gave up my body and my blood to deliver you from slavery to freedom, from death to life, from seeking vengeance against your enemies to, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He asks us to remember, not to make anyone feel guilty or ashamed, but to place us in a story that goes back many, many generations, all the way back to in the beginning, so that no one will be forgotten and everyone will have a name. Gracious Father, may we not only love, but accept and enjoy each other. May your love, joy, peace, and patience be at the heart of our relationships with one another, along with your kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we encourage each other and build one another up in every circumstance. And Lord, may we be willing to love each other as unconditionally as you love us, for such love forgives the wrongs of others and makes up for their many personal faults. In love, help us to forgive without holding on to anger, resentment, or disappointment. May we love and accept one another just as we are, not waiting for change or for perfection, as in Christ you have accepted us. Help us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, as you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen.